Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. No, I was given a topic to actually talk about uh, acute upper airway obstruction. Firstly, I think let's start with the definition, which is basically the blo blockage of uh, airway. Airway starting from the nose. People forget that the nose is an important thing. You get those kids who are born with coronal atresia, they're not able to breathe. You've got those who have CF, who've got polyps, they're also not able to breathe. And also those who've got bronchiolitis, who've heard the importance of actually doing gentle suction. Uh, you've got uh, adenoids, you've got kids who've got uh, big adenoids, tonsils, and going all the way down to the epiglottis, supraglottic structures, where you've got kids that will be born with vocal cords that are not moving either unilateral or bilateral because of uh, neurodevelopmental issues. And you also have CPs, you've got Down syndromes, you've got hypotonia, therefore they're collapsing their posterior pharyngeal airways. And obviously you've got the host of infections, which is basically any EM or any pediatrician's nightmare. But there's an interesting thing. Um, we seldom not able to um, delineate whether is this a steto, is this a strido, and in some cases people are actually not able to pick up whether it's a wheeze. But the important thing is when we're talking about steto, that means it must be an obstruction that's possibly supraglottic, meaning that it should be along the tongue, the orofaryngeal, orofaryngeal uh, space. And sometimes you can actually have obstruction there, therefore causing stride. So I start here, which is basically orofaryngeal obstruction, because last December I was in deep rural Eastern Cape and my nephew came running because he's seeing his uncle, you know, the uncle is always the most favorite person in the family. <laughs> Next thing, he starts breathing funny and he's got a stride and I start losing it. So it's an important thing, but the mom was so calm about it, like, no, this is what he does. He snores at night and it is one of the most common things. Oropharyngeal obstruction, most of our parents are calm with it. You know, he does it at night, he breathes like this, don't worry, and it's that kid that always during the day, he's sleepy, and the teachers are like, he doesn't listen, he wants to sleep in class. And most of us are actually misdiagnosing it. By the time we pick it up, we're like, is it a strido? Is it steto? It's usually steto, because these kids have big adenoids, they've got tonsils, and they've got a funny way of, and especially when they have infection, you're just not sure whether is it steto or strido, and every doctor actually, actually starts panicking. The reason I'm putting it here is that we get a lot of these referrals in our EM. They call the pulmonologists, not because the ENT are not always eager to come downstairs, but just because they are afraid how we're going to manage the airway. What is important is taking a good history. Those kids who've got allergic rhinitis, those kids who've got um, post-nasal grip, coughing at night, mom is always awake because this kid chokes, coughs and chokes and wakes up and sometimes it stops breathing. And the mom is always awake guarding this patient, I mean guarding this baby, or they decide to actually take him from his room to sleep with them because they have to turn him around Ten, every time he's sleeping on his back, he actually has some funny breathing. The important thing is we have to think about those things and those patients, unfortunately, they have to go to ENT. And importantly, so every ENT is going to block you because they're gonna ask you, have you done an ECG? The reason they're asking that is that most of these patients that pick up late when they start having complications, which is pulmonary hypertension in this case, and they're not going to take this patient to theater without having, spoken, uh, without having speaking to an anesthetist. And they'll ask you for an ECG, which will show that the basically a right uh, hypertrophy, which is seen as right axis deviation with the right ventricular strain on ECG. And they'll also ask you about how are the sets when you're sleeping. These are easy things that you can do when you're in, EM, in an EM setup. Most of our EM setups actually have an overnight stay. Take these kids, admit them overnight, do their sets during the day, do their sets during the night. There's no ENT in the land that is actually going to reject this patient. And prove to them that this patient has had recurrent infections of greater than three otitis media or it's that kid who's been sent away or they are calling you as a parent that he's actually not catching up with the other kids. It's only because he's got otitis media with effusion because of the recurrent infections. Therefore, he cannot hear very well. So these are important things that we actually need to address as the doctors. When do we admit them? If the mom says he stops breathing, we don't send those kids away. So any pediatrician who refuses this patient probably doesn't know this. But most of the time, it is important that this patient is discussed with a pediatrician or an ENT. Unfortunately, they are not mine. But anyway, the important things is that they will do, as I've spoken, T's and A's, that is removal of tonsils and idenoids, only if the patient has episodes of uh, otitis media uh, that are greater than three in a year. And if they have uh, secretory otitis media, which is what I was talking about, it's called the glue ear, where they put grommets and these kids are not hearing very well. And obviously, if they are not, uh, they have obstructive sleep apnea at night, which is everything that we've talked about. But now, coming to the interesting stuff that actually gets every doctor 
a bit of adrenaline rush, which is a strider. When we hear a, a strider, what does it mean? It's that harsh noise that's heard during inspiration, and most of the academics would actually argue that this is not true. We know it's not true because it depends where the obstruction is. So if the obstruction, obviously, it's not so severe and it appears to be in the supraglottic region, most of the time it's going to be inspiratory because we appreciate the dynamics and the physics of airflow and what is actually causing the obstruction. And sometimes you find these patients who have been incubated now starting to present with a strider or what is interpreted as a monophonic wheeze, and both interpretations must be, might be good depending on what you hear. But what is important when you have to start panicking and sweating is when the strider is biphasic because it tells you about the severe of the obstruction and that this airway might actually need an airway team and luckily in Tigerberg we've got what we call an a and a a a <coughs> airway team and most of us are not so keen staying at home you call us anytime we are immediately available so there's so many causes it can be croup bacterial tracheitis laryngeal foreign body epiglottitis diphtheria especially with the young mothers who are not so pro immunizing their kids we've got a lot of those kids coming from the overbeck i think people are working in the overbeck region we've seen a whole lot of influx of these kids from last year. We're not sure what's happening that side, whether we've closed down our clinics and also retropharyngeal abscesses. We had two this year and most of them we had the doctors coming from the northern side actually being in the car with the kids, not able to incubate them from their base hospital. But importantly so, what we find in our setup is everyone who's got a stride happened to have a running nose and they have some low-grade fever, they're tachypnic. In our setup, most of the time we call because the patient has croup and it's called an atypical croup. So if it doesn't fit croup, if you've treated it, treated it as croup and it doesn't fit croup, we have to actually run through a differential. So first and foremost is that history and examining the patient is going to give you a couple of clues of what you might be dealing with. If you're dealing with, with tracheitis, this kid, yes, is going to present with overlapping signs that look like croup, but the thing is you give him naps, acrylene naps, he gets more agitated and he's not getting better and he's desaturating. Now he needs to go to an ICU. So we have to look at that. Foreign body, that's the kid, the mom is going to omit the history that actually he started choking. And after then he had a strider, so we have to elicit that history, ask them, was there any history of choking, is it so acute? And also diphtheria, we've spoken about these young mothers who are not so pro-immunizing, let me not say young mothers, that's a politically incorrect statement, also fathers. <laughs> and also epiglottitis, where in retropharyngeal abscesses, back then as pulmonologists in most of our textbook, we said we see this in kids that are greater than three years. But actually this year at Tiger Bay we had six month old and a three month old who had a retropharyngeal abscess. So we need to relook at literature and start thinking about the possibility of retropharyngeal abscesses, especially with those kids with dysphagia and who are not able to feed well and they like sleeping on their side while they're still young, which is actually unheard of. Laryngeal papillomatosis, I'm including this year because we've got those kids. During that time we hadn't implemented ARVs who actually missed that PMTCT uh, opportunity. Now they're living with the retroviral disease and they present with a hoarse voice. They've been having the hoarse voice. The mother is not worried about it. And all of a sudden now, because they've got papillomas that are growing in the laryngeal area, be it supraglottic or infraglottic, they start having aphonia and they start breathing funny. So these are the kids that you have to start thinking about. <coughs> So just to go through them, tracheitis, it is, not, it is actually more common than epiglottitis, but you will see that the referral that we always have is an epiglottitis patient. So we have to start thinking about uh, tracheitis, and this presents between ages of three weeks to about 16 years, but it's more common in those kids who are less than five years, around four years of age. And as I said, they have a typical similar history as that of a troop. But the interesting, interesting thing is that they will never respond to the treatment that you'll be giving them. So these patients, you have to start thinking about <coughs> tracheitis. Importantly, if you do a chest X-ray, they've got what we call a steeple sign here. Steeple sign, that's the same thing you'll see in croup. And if you do a lateral X-ray, you'll see that there's a lot of irregularity in the air trachea. So these patients actually have uh, bacterial tracheitis. What is important about all these cases that we have to talk about, do not touch them if you, do not, if you don't have to do anything. One, if you're not supposed to do a blood gas, don't do a blood gas. If you're not trying to put up a drip and the patient is actually doing well, do not put up a drip. So do not agitate the patient because you agitating the patient, you being curious, wanting to look at what is happening in the airway, you might actually uh, precipitate a laryngospasm, worsening the clinical picture. So these are the patients that we usually, if you've got an anesthetic, you've got a theater, you want to take them into theater, you want to gas them down, and you want them to keep 
keep the dynamics that is protecting the airway, which will help you in actually protecting the airway. ABC all the way to ICU. So the important thing is if you're able to protect your ABC, take the lift all the way to A9. That's where we'll do everything or take it to A5 because we'll do it in a controlled environment. You do not want a situation where everyone is running over each other. We always like doing bronchoscopies. My boss is actually one of the guys that does most bronchoscopies in the area. But the reason you do it or why the Europeans suggest that you have to do it is that though you have started antibiotics, these kids actually start healing later. So the important thing is we go in, we scrape all that epithelium that is um, that exudate and also that epithelium that is actually broken down to help quick recovery of these patients when they're in ICU. Epiglottitis, not so common, but this kid is toxic. He presented in the morning with the funny illness fever and all of a sudden it's four o'clock they're starting to obstruct their airway. That's the kid that you do not want to agitate. You do not want to look what's happening down their airway. You want to get the anesthetist or the airway team get them into theater. So the important thing, what you can do is, if you're still playing around with time because the anesthetist is never in the building, is to do a lateral x-ray where you actually see <laughs> the swollen, <laughs> swollen epiglottis. Uh, it's called the thumb sign, as the Europeans call it. And when you do an FPC, while you're still waiting for us, you'll see that they have a leukocyte, leukocytosis or a raised white cell count that's actually more than 20,000. So it just shows you how progressive these kids are. And most of the time, they actually progress to an extent where they become so septic and most people miss that they're actually not able to protect their airway. So this is a very important thing to keep in mind. If it's a short history and they have a history of having an upper airway obstruction, we've spoken about the airway team. So the airway team is important in this case because most of these kids according to the European literature, they end up getting a cracky if the ENT, the pulmonologist, or the anesthetist fail. So you do not want people that are not able to do an emergency cracky around you. You want people that would be competent. And obviously, we cover them with uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Peritonsillar abscess, we've spoken about it. It challenged us this year. We actually didn't think that we'd see kids around six months would have a peritonsillar abscess. But during the age of two years, these are the kids that have chronic swelling around the neck and every parent is fine, every clinic is fine, we keep on giving them amoxil, it's gonna go down, it's just a gland, it's just a gland, and all of a sudden one day they cannot breathe. And this is actually even difficult for pulmonologists and also ENTs because most of the time, someone showed a video scope. The video scope, I actually think it's one, it's going to be one of the future gadgets that we're going to be using because it does help you with incubating. Even anesthetists are not happy to use a laryngoscope just to incubate. Even us as pulmonologists, we prefer using a bronchoscopy to actually guide the tube into the airway. So while you're doing that, the ENTs are preparing to drain it because even if you start antibiotics, this patient is not going to get better in ICU. So that becomes important. Yeah, in, if you're in places like Tiger Bed, you have the, you have the luxury of doing CT scans, but if you are in a place like uh, Calbremer where CT scans are not functional at night, you do a lateral chest x-ray, <laughs> and what you see is on the lateral chest x-ray, the retropharyngeal space around C2, it should increase at least to about seven, centimeter, seven millimeters, and around C8, it should increase, uh, the length should be about 14 uh, millimeters. Foreign bodies, my favorite. Uh, we always see this every week. We have to beg the anesthetist to open a special um, anesthetic, I mean, uh, theater just to help us remove foreign bodies. Can you just play the video for us there? <laughs> so this patient had been kept for about a week in one of our referral hospitals as an atypical group that's not responding to, to treatment. And one history that we had to ask the mom was, was there any history of choking? And when we went to do a bronchoscopy, who can guess what was there sitting on the, between the vocal cords? Sorry? Yes, exactly. You know, a two-liter bottle, there's usually that thing that sits there. That's basically what they aspirated and it was sitting there. And most of the time, this week we just had two of... Uh, this week we had two of those, actually, that we had to remove. It's a pity that both the videos are quite long. So this is an important thing that we have to think about. And both the teachers actually said he actually had a coughing spell while he was still in class. So that's an important thing to think about because there's always a very clear history. And these are the guys who are six years old, they are playing rough, they've got small objects in their mouth. So that's an important thing. And then our favorite topic at Tigerberg, which is croup, which I didn't want to spend so much time because everything else is croup when we see a strider. But not everything is croup when we actually see a strider. So just to say, 
those are the ones that have a parking cough. If he doesn't have a parking cough, if he's not responding to treatment, he's got a stride. Yes, he's got a preceding history of a respiratory, upper respiratory infection, but if he doesn't respond to treatment, he's an atypical group, and as such, we have to start thinking about other common things in kids. So I don't want to spend more time, and yes, we always say it's a clinical diagnosis. We spend a lot of time at Tiger Bank actually doing x-rays and all those lateral things. They do not help in management of this patient. If you give them adrenaline naps, depending on where you're working, if you give them adrenaline naps, if they are quite ill, and you see a response which should be within the first 20 minutes after giving them the adrenaline labs, which is one is to 1,000, one mil of adrenaline, one mil of normal saline, there should be a response. If there's no response, start thinking about other things. There are two types of cases. You've got the mild cases, you've got the severe cases, and there's grading, where we say it's a grade one strider, which is basically an inspiratory strider, and then you've got a grade two. So that's grunting, actually. Grade one and grade two. And then you have a grade three where you've got an inspiratory and expiratory and you also have a pulsus paradoxus. And a grade four, obviously, that's the kid that's also going to make you to be cyanosed because he's already cyanosed and you cannot oxygenate him at all. But the important thing is, if you think it's a group, you've managed him as a group, he's not giving you a response within an hour, start thinking about calling an airway team. Thank you very much.